The call came in, finally, in late morning. There had been much debate for the previous few hours as generals and members of the inner circle tried to persuade him not to venture out, that it was far too dangerous, as the American planes reigned supreme over the skies when the sun was high, and if they were caught out after the sun had set, the British and their RAF ruled the night. He had not far to travel to his work, if indeed he ever was not working. His villa had been constructed in the gardens of the most powerful person in the land, although that in itself may not quite be true. He did rule over a land, destroyed, a land where soldiers of the army moved with uncertainty as to their orders as fronts collapsed, army groups were reorganised, and those at the very top vied to put themselves in a position that would, they hoped, render them necessary to the rebuilding the ruins that now surrounded them. Six years in, and the days when the Wilhelmstrasse was clear of rubble, when funerary possessions of Heydrich or Werner Mulders in 1942 and 1941 respectively had travelled unimpeded along streets where only the clouds cast shadows upon the smooth tarmac, the Reich's borders were at their greatest extent, and it wasn't quite fitting to call Goering Meyer. Those days seemed long ago. Now the buildings were predominantly smouldering ruins. The dining hall of the old Reichskanzlei, Bismarck's palace in which the great old Iron Man had overseen the gathering of Austro-Hungary, France, the United Kingdom, Italy, the Ottoman Empire and Russia, many of which were now Germany's enemies in settling the crisis in the Balkans in 1878, had been destroyed the night before last. Much of the old city of Berlin, the area before the Marienkirche had been destroyed. Roland Freisler had been killed in the bombing raid of February the 3rd, exactly a month prior, and the amount of time that residents of the city spent in their basements was beginning to outweigh the time they could spend in their apartments themselves. On this last point, as he stood in the gardens, gardens that had more water features than intended due to the wide craters left by the bombs, reflecting, he could relate. His villa, a villa that, amongst the staff and people of the Chancery, had come to be called after him, had not been spared the destruction of the war. It too, like so many other buildings, had been damaged, and more time was spent underground. The moments he could spend in the open air were often interrupted by the air raid sirens which signalled all those around to stump out their precious cigarettes, a highly sought-after commodity after the destruction of the Yenidzi factory and the city that surrounded it, Dresden not even three weeks prior, and returned to the underground domain of shouting officers, hurrying adjutants, and those who felt already that most, if not all, was lost. For what he had heard, it was very much like this at the moment. Although he had retreated into the fresh air, if you can call the winds that carried the dust of a ruined Berlin fresh anymore, but there was always a constant rotation of people wanting to escape the underground delusions, for the above-ground reality. It seemed as if everyone knew it was over, apart from one person, but no one dared say it for the fear of becoming another one of Himmler's henchmen's victims hung from lampposts throughout the city with placards around their necks. Only Hitler still believed that there was a way out of this mess he had taken Germany into. He, Erich Kemper, began working for Hitler as his primary driver in 1934. During the now almost 11 years since he was first tasked with being the chauffeur to the Führer, he had witnessed the arrest of Ernst Röhm, the disgraced head of the SA, who was executed for a treasonous plot on the life of Hitler. He had driven Hitler into Poland as he surveyed the recently defeated nation in September 1939, and been with him on numerous rallies and field tours through the years in service for the dictator. It was upon the request of the Führer that he had divorced his wife in October of the previous year, due to the persistent rumours that she was formerly of the Habseidenen Gewerbe, but also her erratic and loose mouth, which he always had liked, as it matched quite his own. Even though he had divorced her, he still kept her in an apartment on Berlin's formerly luxurious, now somewhat destroyed, boulevard of the Kefirstendamm. Stumping out of the remains of his almost burnt-to-the-tip cigarette, he returned underground, 
The fleet of cars that he was entrusted with maintaining now numbered almost 40. But not all were in Berlin. Some cars were still in Berchtesgarten, others in Munich. But there was a significant fleet of the Mercedes W152s, which they simply called the Type G. But with fuel running short and the little fuel that had been available being slowly squirreled away by those who called themselves the most devoted to the Fuhrer, but were ready to flee the moment the Russians got to where their breath could rustle the leaves of the city. The pompous Goering, soft-faced Speer, or the inept Himmler. Even with guards placed watching the precious fuel, it still seemed to be slowly seeping into the fuel tanks of the elite. But there was a few cars that could not be touched, even by the greedy hands of Goering and those were the ones reserved for the Führer. Always prepared and ready to be put into mobilization with the ringing of the telephone that relayed the command that on this morning, the 3rd of March 1945, came through. The Führer wants to leave the Reichskanzlei compound and investigate for himself the Eastern Front. But this was not 1942, when the Wehrmacht was almost knocking on Stalin's door in Moscow. Rather, it was 1945, and the Russians were at the order, just 100 kilometers from Berlin. Kemke received his orders. The commander was to see General der Infanterie Busse and his staff at the headquarters of the Rome 101 Army Corps under the command of the 9th Army at Schloss Harnikop. Achtung, Achtung, hier ist die Sendestelle Berlin im Voxhaus. Meine Damen und Herren, welcome to Achtung History and Hitler's Last Day Out, presented by the Berlin Tour Guide and Simon J. James. In idyllic surroundings, the palace rests. The waters of the lake flow at its footings. The trees of the Mark Brandenburg shade its windows, or so they once did. It was as part of a dowry that the Schloss was built. The land on which the small village of Harnikop rested was tied to another local town, Prutzel, which had come into the possession of Prussian Minister of the State, Paul Anton von Kameke. Member of the first king of Prussia's Friedrich der Erste's bodyguard and general within the military in the year 1711. It was in Prutzel where Paul Anton settled, building himself a Baroque palace designed by the Berlin and the king's own architect, Andreas Schlüter. But it was to be his granddaughter who was to have an impact on Harnikop. Friederike von Kameke was to marry. Her proposed spouse, the son of the former Chancellor of the Russian Empire, Gabriel Ivanovich Golovkin. Peter Friedrich Christian von Golovkin, who just so happened to also be her first cousin. The land on the shores of the Lake of Harnikop was her dowry, and with permission of the Prussian government, the king, her husband Peter Friedrich Christian, was allowed to acquire landed property. In 1772, construction began. Slowly from the earth, a long palace began to rise. A double-tiered roof crowned a simple Baroque residence, but it was only simple in terms of the exterior decoration. Its proportions still were grand. For ease of access with the village that lay on the opposite shore, the lake was dammed, creating the upper and aptly named Grosse See, and the lower equally justifiably named Schloss See on which Schloss Harnikop, completed in 1776, rested amongst gardens styled after the English fashion, with flowing lawns of tall grass and trees of oak preferred over the French Baroque style that had been popular at the beginning of the century. It would only remain in the hands of the Glovkins for a short time, for just 11 years after the palace's completion, Peter Friedrich Christian von Golovkin died, followed a year later by his wife. The palace and Harnikop defaulted back to the von Kameke. The Kameke, however, in 1801, sold the Schloss at Harnikop to the great trader, 
Ernst Jakob Freiherr von Eckartstein. Eckartstein had made a considerable fortune in the glass business, manufacturing, particularly, mirrored glass in Amelith, in today's Lower Saxony. But a large portion of his wealth had come from the contract to supply England's Duke of York the provisions he required for his army whilst on campaign. In 1799, Eckartstein had relocated to Berlin, purchased a palace on Berlin's prestigious Dunhofplatz, and invested 500,000 Thaler in the Preussischen Seehandlung. With his vast wealth, he purchased much of what the von Kammerker family had left, including Prutzel, Reichenau, Grunau, Predico, and Harnikop. However, Harnikop was amongst the most unloved of the estates. And whilst the other estates, especially Reichenau, flourished under Eckhard Stein and his successors, with new methods of agriculture being developed, Harnikop was all but forgotten. The unloved estate left the possessions of Eckhard Stein just nine years after Eckhard Stein's purchase. The Schloss changed hands numerous times as it became leased by families wishing for a stylish country life near Prussia's capital, but few stayed for long, and all were merely renters of the property. That was until August Alexis Edrard von Hesler. Von Hesler purchased the property for 64,000 Thaler in 1837 and became invested in the area, becoming in 1844 the Landretter, or County Councillor, for the Oberbarnim district to which Prutzel and Harnikop belonged, a position that was later occupied by Theobald von Bethmann Holweg, who served as Reich Kanzler from 1909 to 1917. As his tasks as Landerater took him away from Harnikop more and more often, von Hessler took the decision to pass the ownership of Schloss Harnikop to his son Gottlieb von Hessler. Gottlieb greatly enjoyed both Schloss Harnikop and the village from which it took its name, that lay across the dam between the lakes. But it was to be, more often than not, a retreat for himself. Where his father had been a major within the Prussian army, Gottlieb would rise to rank as the chief quartermaster of the general staff and eventually being granted the title of General Feldmarschall. In 1905, he retired from the service of the army, but he came into the service of the people as a member of the Preussisches Herrenhaus, the Prussian House of Lords. He became a strong advocate for vocational training to further the education of the children of Prussia within more specified disciplines, whilst also taking inspiration from Britain's Robert Baden Powell in his founding of the Scout Movement, something to which Gottlieb von Hesler believed was necessary as the bridge between the youth and the army was too broad. Von Hesler died at his home, Schloss Harnikop, in 1919, yet he left behind no heirs. The estate fell to the descendants of his mother's family, the Schönermark family. It was also in 1919 that the land reform was introduced by the new German government of the Weimar Republic. Article 155 of the New Reich's Constitution read, The cultivation of the land is a duty of the landowner to the community. As such, eventually Schloss Harnikop was merged with the community of Harnikop and held in trust. In 1932, the situation in Germany was changing rapidly. The economic crisis that had persisted since the Wall Street crash of October 1929 had created many problems for the people of Germany especially combined with the ever-changing revolving door of the office of Chancellor, many people of Germany started to look towards the exaggerated promises and pointed blame of Hitler and his National Socialist Party. From 12 seats in 1928, the year before the financial crisis, the National Socialist Party of Adolf Hitler rose to become the second largest party in the Reichstag. In 1930, with 107 seats, before continuing on this trend and becoming the largest party just two years later in July 1932, with 230 seats. It was evident that the Nazi party was exerting its influence on more and more states and local districts across the German lands. But with the rapid expansion that came, potentially to Hitler and the Nazis, even as a surprise, a vacuum of people needed to exert National Socialist practices and ideology on the local land crease, existed. They simply was not enough people considered to be a good national socialist, i.e. people trained to be able to dish out the tough decisions that were needed to bring a population that still understood democracy 
and the authority of Weimar law into line with the brutality of the National Socialist ideology that soon would install a totalitarian regime. It was in this vein that the Reichsführer Schuler to train the Sturmabteilung, or SA, was founded. The SA, also known as the Brown Shirts, for their use of surplus brown shirts bought cheap after the end of World War I, began as a small group in 1920, before being organized and named Sturmabteilung in 1921. It was founded as the gymnastics and sports department of the party, but it served really to fight with political conviction against the communists and members of other parties in political bar brawls. But through organization, the SA changed into a more ordered arm of the party that would instigate political clashes with left-wing parties that led to street fighting wherever there was an office of the SA. This became their main task of the SA, to instigate attacks against political opponents. The purpose of the Reichsführerschule was, initially, to train members of the SA into becoming strong and politically correct in the vein of NSDAP thinking members, to turn them from bar brawlers into leaders, to possess the qualities needed to govern with an iron fist and to ensure that when Hitler did become Chancellor, the National Socialists' doctrine was exerted across Germany, without opposition, that the people of Germany would fall into line and support Hitler and his regime, but to do this task was first to convert the ruffians of the SA into the very people that could persuade the non-Nazis to the cause. Or as historian Claudia Kunz put it, Nazi ruffians require intellectual retrofitting in order to debate with critics to inspire confidence amongst non-Nazis. Hitler had some foresight to his rise, and on the 15th of June 1931 had opened the first Reichsführerschule in Munich to provide the systematic training for members of the SA to govern under the leadership of the highly decorated yet treacherous to the Weimar Republic, Kurt Kummer, who had participated in the failed Kapp Putsch of 1920. The courses were to typically last four weeks, with many of the teachers being early members and the most staunchly political of the NSDAP. The indoctrination was to be total. With the expansion of the NSDAP, more schools were needed, and there just happened to be a palace in need of a use, not far from Berlin. Planning for the conversion of Schloss Harnikop into an SA Reichsführer Schule began even before the election of 1932. On the 3rd of February 1932, Herbert Merker, an SA member, party spokesman, and successful agitator for the NSDAP, was appointed to the task of heading up the Reichsführer Schule that would be located within Schloss Harnikop. The first classes were scheduled to begin in the summer, with the hopes that through a long, seven-week course, the new politically-minded members of the Berlin-Brandenburg SA would be ready to take up posts across the Reich by mid-autumn. Even Chancellor Brüning's banning of the communist Rotfront Kämpferbund and Hitler's Sturmabteilung did little to stop the Sturmabteilung in their setting up of the Reichsführerschule, and by September 1932, they publicly showed their brand new school to the National Socialist supporters in the Hermann Esser edited Illustrator Biobachter. Among the pictures of planes flying over flagpoles bearing the swastika flag of the National Socialist Party, men dressed from head to toe in the brown of the SA uniforms marching in the sandy ground of Brandenburg, comes pictures of Merker at his desk. Men gathered around the National Socialist Gauleiter of Brandenburg, Dr. Schlanger, and pictures of bare-chested men sucking in the beer bellies that are ready to fall like boulders from a cliff once a photographer had depressed the shutter button. Accompanying the pictures comes this article that begins with a poem beneath an SA man looking sternly forward. Und wenn auch der Glaube an Rex verbracht, das sich nun selber gerichtet, er opfert und kämpft trotz Schande und Schmack, bis die Feinde des Volkes vernichtet. And even though the belief in justice was shattered, which now judges itself, he sacrifices and fights despite shame and dishonor until the enemies of the people are destroyed. If you come on a hike through the Orderbruch and steer your steps from the old town of Reitzen to Harnikop, you'll be amazed to find such an idyllic spot 
whose lovely beauty seems to be in stark contrast to the common views of the Mark Brandenburg, the gritting sandbox of the German Empire. Close to the shores of two lakes, in the middle of an ancient park, lies a proud castle, trusty and simple in its construction. Once the seat of the Graden Hazeler, today a National Socialist Leaders School. SA men and party comrades have worked tirelessly to make their premises fit for the purpose. Together with the SA Führers, who attend courses here lasting several weeks, they have created a home that could not be more beautiful. An open staircase leads up to spacious hallways from which you can access the large reception rooms. On the upper floor, there are also wide corridors and high, bright rooms, which are used as team rooms and which have been whirling through all the rooms of this house since the early hours of the morning. Oberführer von Wechmar, Stabsführer von Arnim, Standartenführer Schäfer, Gauleiter Dr. Schlanger, and others want to visit the course, which has been here for two weeks. The rooms are being scrubbed and polished, the paths and footbridges are being raked and cleaned. In short, everything is flashing and flashing. Three airplanes and several cars finally announce their arrival. Attention, judge, you! The leaders walk away from the front, and then the students show what they have already learned. The teachers, how you have taught them. Until finally a gracious criticism concludes the military and sports demonstrations. Comradeship and discipline. Obedience and performance of duty, these are the virtues which are inherent in every National Socialist and which are promoted in service and community life in the Führer School. Soon the SA leaders will leave the school again and return to their storms to teach them what they have learned, to implore them in the spirit which distinguishes National Socialism above all of us and which makes all internal and external hostilities against it ineffective. Amongst the first students of the Reichsführer Schule to graduate was Werner Köppen, SA Führer, who would later become the adjutant to Alfred Rosenberg, a chief perpetrator in the starvation caused amongst the Russian people after Operation Barbarossa of June 1941, and as Reich Minister for the Occupied Eastern Territories, in which he actively pursued the systematic elimination of the Jewish people, both crimes against humanity for which he, Rosenberg, was found guilty of in 1946 at the Nuremberg trials and hung. Merke did not remain in command of the Reichsführer Schule at Schloss Harnikop for long. However, and shortly after the publication of the September issue of the Illustrator Biobachter, Merke was replaced with Karl Moritz. The essay was going from strength to strength as Hitler grew in power. The National Socialist movement was sweeping the nation and many young men were keen to join the Sturmabteilung either with friends or on their own. For many it was a way out of the impoverished lives many had. Many of the SA members came from the lower working classes and unemployed, whilst the SS was made up more of the middle class. But many also bitterly resented the work they had to take on after they had graduated from the Reichsführer Schule. Claudia Kunz writes, Spreading the communal spirit also meant intensive community organizing, which included many tasks that had been labeled in the 1920s as Kleinarbeit, or little work. Instead of the prerequisites of enjoying their new offices, old fighters were encouraged to organize neighborhoods, which entailed door-to-door canvassing, fundraising, and publicizing rallies, tasks that Nazi women had done before 1933. Nevertheless, membership of the SA was on the rise. From 60,000 members in 1930, the organization had grown to count 471,384 by August 1932, 700,000 by the end of 1932, beginning of 1933, and by June 1934, the SA organization of Ernst Röhm numbered 4.5 million. To Hitler and the Nazi governmental elite, however, the power that the SA gave Rom was becoming a concern. It is reported that Rom apparently jokingly said on numerous occasions, Bedenkt, fast, vier Millionen Raubauken stehen hinter mir. Remember, four million bullies stand behind me. Ernst Rom was a notoriously embittered man. He had a deep-seated loathing for the old Prussian officer class, 
and wished for a merge of the Reichswehr into the Sturmabteilung, whilst purging the officers and creating a new hierarchy, which potentially would have reverted the stand of the army into pre-Prussian days. Coupled with this, he and the SA leaned more to the socialist aspect of National Socialism, and was not pleased with where he felt the National Socialist movement had come to rest politically. That the entire society needed a revolution, and it appeared he was prepared to carry out this revolution with or without Hitler. On the night of the 30th of June 1934, however, Hitler and the other members of the NSDAP elite put an end to the threat of Rom and the SA. When Rom and the SA leaders were lured under false pretenses to Tegensee and either arrested or murdered, Rom himself was arrested and the next day was shot. Quickly, with the demise of Rome, came the demise of the SA. Numbers started to fall. Between July and September, membership fell by 2 million, and by October 1935, it was down to 1.6 million. Falling membership, a lack of distrust of the NSDAP elite towards the SA, meant that its functions were limited, and when a space was needed to be filled in a ministry or in a government, those of the ever-expanding SS under Heinrich Himmler were given priority over the SA. Therefore, by 1936, Schloss Harnikop was no longer a SA Reichsführer Schuler. The rune that was to be worn upon the left sleeves as a badge of honor, the Tier rune, a black arrow with white and red borders pointing up, was rarely to be seen. As graduates were no more, and the school found a new purpose as an evangelical Frauenhilfsheim, a woman's home. It remained this way for the years when Hitler was master of Europe when the German Anschluss Austria, when the British Prime Minister said yes, Herr Hitler, to the German Führer's demands on Czechoslovakia, when Poland was invaded and divided by the great evils of the 20th century, and Denmark, Norway, and the Netherlands, Belgium, France, all fell to the armies of the Wehrmacht, which had absolved 80% of the SA members, and eventually Hitler turned on his ally and invaded the Soviet Union. But those days when the Wehrmacht seemed unstoppable, when little stood in their way, were over. The morning outlook looked bleak to the ceremonial commander of the Volkssturm. The Eastern Front was collapsing. The Army Group Vistula had been placed under Heinrich Himmler, who with no military experience had proved a disaster. Operation Solstice, an operation to relieve the old fortified city and now Festung of Kostrin, had failed. The situation was bleak. Taking the time in the morning of the third to evaluate the situation, he sat down in his villa to write in his diary. Within the east, activity is still centred on Pomerania, where the enemy is attempting to come together to break our northern flank and dive in. Between Kuzlin and Schlava, the enemy has reached the road that is crossing of the Graubo. Rummelsburg has been recaptured by a German counterattack from the southwest and then pushed on south for 10 kilometers. However, the resistance then proved too strong and the army could penetrate no further. Our lines now run some 10 kilometers northwest from Rummelsburg and then east towards Heidelberg to the Vistula. The left flank of the enemy attack in the neustettin bublitz kuzlin area runs north some 30 kilometers west of Neustettin. Here again, our initial gains from the counterattacks could gather no more further ground. A second focal point of the enemy's attack is north of Ritz. With armor, the enemy has attacked northwards towards Stargard Koslin Road, and with the advance armor reaching this and the railway south of Leibs. More enemy forces swung north of Ritz, moving west towards Stargard. At the same time, the Soviets attacked northwards towards Arnwalde before crossing the Stargard. Reitz Railway at Zachen. In the Piritz area and the west, the enemy has attacked towards Stettin, penetrating to a depth of 8 to 10 kilometers. Piritz is now in the enemy's hands. The Soviet advance in eastern Pomerania has again forced a critical situation upon us. We should have expected it, but we did not. Because we are too weak on all sectors of the front, the Soviets are finding great ease in concentrating their forces on a point and then breaking through our lines. Like a fire brigade, we are moving our forces around to plug the holes that are leaking as best we can. 
but we suffer severely in the process. The enemy air terror has once again raged over the territory of the Reich. Dresden, Chemnitz, Magdeburg and Linz have all been attacked. Seventy or at least up to seventy aircraft have been reported to have been shot down. This is obviously nothing like enough to put a stop to these flights, yet it is better than nothing. I have been discussing with my staff a problem concerning the initiation of total war. This will be of decisive importance for bringing replacements into the Wehrmacht. He also, like Eric Kempka, was situated not far from the bunker in which the Führer had resigned himself to more, as the air raids had gotten heavier. He had access to the military maps that adorned the tables and the walls of the Führer bunker, and saw the red and blue lines and arrows moving day by day as the map showed how quickly the Eastern Front was collapsing. To think that the Eastern Front was once at Stalingrad, and now it was in Kostrin, where Friedrich der Grosse had been imprisoned by his father, whilst he was still Friedrich Kronprinz, just 100 kilometers from the capital of the Reich, that was proclaimed to last a thousand years. Erich Kempke made haste, he had five Mercedes W152 Type G automobiles prepared to leave at a moment's notice, and the Führer's bodyguard was now swarming over them, ready to escort a man who had, in his sitting in the dark, become blind to the reality of the war. Even as they were leaving, the officers of the bunker expressed their disdain for Hitler's decision to leave the Führer bunker. The risk was certainly high, and for many it came strange now that even after the pleadings of many amongst the Nazi high circles to visit troops, make more public appearances to boost morale, that as the Soviets came crashing through the lines of the German armies, as the Volkssturm young boys and antiquated men with their Italian rifles, single Panzerschrecks, bicycles and armbands as uniforms were quashed under the tracks of the numerous T-34 tanks of the Red Army, that the Führer wished to witness the lines now. Perhaps, however, it was not to boost morale, or to give advice, but rather to witness how close Germany was to catastrophic defeat, so that as the war progressed, his decision on how he would end his war could come easier. The motorcade left the underground garage that was managed by Kempka. Five drab, olive-green, bizarre-looking vehicles. Neither did they look light, nor did they look heavy. Short and stocky, high and low, all at the same time. They had been built between 1937 and 1941, and were a far cry from the luxurious armor-plated limousines by the same manufacturer that Kempke had ordered especially for the Führer. The seats were not rich leather and sprung, but padded wooden boxes. They appeared to be salvaged from the wooden pews of the long-since-closed churches of the Reich. The floor was flat, and the roof retractable, though it was, provided little enclosure when the sides of the vehicle were open to the elements. Kempke turned the motorcade onto Wilhelmstrasse. The Führer sat next to himself in the front passenger seat of the Mercedes Type G. Wilhelmstrasse had once been the centre of German government since 1871 and now the grand old palaces, the offices of the Reichsverkehrsministerium, Finanzministerium, showed the effects of the British aerial campaign over Germany. The Propaganda Ministerium extension still stood amongst the rubble its modern construction of concrete and steel providing better protection against the blockbuster and firebombs dropped from above. But the 18th century palace of Prince Karl, also known as the Ordnungspalais, now lay in ruins, its baroque panelling and parquet floors kindling for fires that had destroyed so much. As they drove on, Hitler's gaze remained sternly forward. To look upon the ruins was to come to terms with defeat. On to Unterlin Linden they turned, where little over twelve years before thousands of SA men had paraded with burning torches in hand past the luxurious hotels of the world. They drove past the Hotel Bristol, where only half of the building remained. The few people in the streets looked on the motorcade in disbelief, questioning if their eyes deceived them. Was it indeed the Führer who had seldom been seen in public since the turning of the tide of the war that was now driving in the small motorcade? through a predominantly deserted Berlin. Friedrich der Grosse stood entombed in brick at the centre of the boulevard, a man that he, the Führer, admired greatly, whose portrait by Anton Graf hung over the desk in the study beneath the gardens of the Reichskanzlei. Could he hope for a miracle of House Brandenburg, like that had happened to Friedrich der Grosse, when Tsarina Elizabeth of Russia died and her alliance fell to pieces the last time that the Russians were trying to break into Brandenburg?
during the Seven Years' War. Openplatz was on his right, where Goebbels had burned the books of those that the NSDAP considered inferior. The Staatsoper that had been damaged on the 10th of April 1941 that had been reopened in December 1942 with Wagner's Meistersingen von Nuremberg was once again destroyed with the aerial bombings of exactly a month earlier. Berlin, it was evident to all those who passed through on that morning, was a skeleton of its former self. But even as the buildings collapsed under their own weight, still the structures of the National Socialist Society remained in place. Defeatism was a crime punishable by the hangsman's noose, and the brutes of Himmler and Kaltenbrunner still stalked the streets of a city that in 1932 had been dealt a blow by the Reichsregierung of Franz von Papen, whose emergency powers had deprived Prussia and Berlin of their democratically elected government that had been opposed to Hitler and his brown shirts. A blow to Prussia that had allowed the brown shirts to once again roam the streets of Berlin freely and had put the instruments of the Prussian Polizei based at the Rotterberg on Alexanderplatz in the hands of those who leaned more to the teachings of the far right than the democracy on which Prussia had been built. It was past these buildings, past the Rotterberg, and now that the motorcade had turned into the Grosse Frankfurter Allee, leaving the historic limits of Berlin and driving through the once high-density living quarters of a city that had grown in economic power and size with such rapidity at the turn of the century, but with the war was now a wasteland. The British and the Americans allowed to rule freely over the city, with only the occasional burst of flak to deter. The Berliners had grown accustomed to the failures of Goering, and in their dry humour began the whispered humour. When a silver aeroplane flies over, it's American. When there is a green plane, that's the British. When there are no aircraft, that's the Luftwaffe. With the Grosse Frankfurter Allee, it was a straight shot through Friedrichshain and Lichtenberg, and the countryside and the Mark Brandenburg that lay beyond. The city gave way to fields, the small houses of the people of Brandenburg who still tended to small allotments of land that produced the only real food that could be accessed as more and more food became replaced with ersatz, or replacement versions, facsimiles of the real thing. Driving northeast, the motorcade passed through Hohenschenhausen, then arrived in Ahrensfelder, where as the car came to a halt, the people, who were on the streets doing their best to go about a normality unfamiliar, began to recognise the forlorn figure in the deep green, whose gaunt face spoke of the ailments that he was suffering internally, ailments that he refused to have addressed by anyone other than his personal physician, the questionable Dr. Theo Morel. Dr. Morel for many years had been creating increasing doses of concoctions of drugs, formed of morphine, cocaine, amphetamines and other substances that masked the problems to which the Führer was reluctant for various reasons to truly address. As Hitler had left the bunker earlier that day, Morel had offered his services, but Hitler had turned his request to join him on the journey to the East Downs, stating that he required Dr. Morel to be awaiting him when he returned, and that the journey would be too dangerous. He flatly refused the request, to which Dr. Morel put little struggle to. Now sat in the automobile, the whisper spread and more faces began to appear from behind the doors normally kept securely closed. Slowly they began to approach the motorcade to witness the man whose voice had once reigned over the airways and now was seldom heard. The man who had once presented himself at all kinds of events, from the digging of a new autobahn to speaking before the workers of factories large and small. But now, as his war raged on the German people, he sought to a protective bunker whilst those he had subjected to the war were left to feel the full force of the enemies he had made. Yet still he commanded a presence that Eric Kempke saw turn the desperation of the people into hope. Perhaps some hoped he would meet his end sooner rather than later, and this godforsaken war could come to a close. Forwards the motorcade moved, leaving the small gatherings of people behind as it passed from outlaying towns to villages, along roads lined by trees starting to show the buds of spring upon their branches. Ahrensfelder became Bloomberg, which became Seefeld, then Verneuchen. All the while, eyes within the cars looked above, searching the skies for any sign of the enemy aircraft that might just strafe the motorcade. After the village of Wertful, there was some easing of the tension as the motorcade turned off the road that would have taken them to the spa town of Bad Freienwald, beyond which the Oderbruch lay.
Instead, they turned east along a road that led them through the dense forest, a mixture of the deciduous and evergreen. For 13 kilometers, repetitive rows of trees passed by the motorcade, and for those few minutes, if it were not for the Mercedes Type G and the uniforms worn by all those in the automobiles as they drove, it was as if the war could have been a thousand kilometers away rather than 50. It was a harsh contrast from the serenity of the forest. Schloss Harnikop was frantic with activity. The officers and the adjutants who had been informed by those of the high command representatives within the Führerbunker had hurriedly gathered at Schloss Harnikop, which had become the general commandos, 101 army corps, under the command of Wilhelm Berlin. Wilhelm Berlin, a highly decorated officer of World War I, had a year prior received the Ritterkreuz des Eisernen Kreuzes, now was playing host to his direct superior, General de Infanterie Theodor Busser, commander of the 9th Army to which the C-1 Corps was attached. General Oberst Robert Ritter von Greim of the Luftwaffe, Franz Reuss, commander of the Luftlotte VI, which had been attempting to destroy the bridges across the Oder to put a halt to the advancement of the Soviet troops, but lack of fuel had led to much of the strength of the division being grounded. And General de Flach Artillerie, Job Odebrecht, Kommandierender General des Zweite Flachkorps. All anxiously awaited the Führer, not knowing what mood he might be in, whether he was going to meddle in the affairs of the army or quietly sit and listen. General de Infanterie Busse, like many amongst the upper echelons of the Wehrmacht, had been concerned with the appointment of the military inept Himmler as commander of the army group Vistula and the decisions of the Führer that had proved successful earlier in the war were now proving to be disastrous and made out of loyalty rather than military sense. The motorcade drove along Hauptstrasse and turned left across the dam that separated the old lake into two before the Schloss. The drive from Berlin had taken 90 minutes, and now the wheels of the Mercedes Type G were rolling on the gravel of a palace that had remained pristine in its simplistic Baroque design since the 18th century. The troops of the C-1 Corps gathered around to catch a glimpse of the Führer as he exited from the front seat of the car to stand to attention and return the straight-arm salute that the soldiers now raised for him. Officers gathered around the Führer, who wobbled side to side as he walked between the uniforms of generals and staff officers, even managing to laugh as he spoke with them. But despite the smiles, his figure did not command the presence as it once had when he stood before the thousands at the Nuremberg party rallies. His head no longer held high, but drooped down as his shoulders hunched. He entered the Schloss as a crew of the Deutsche Wochenschau hastily arrived, having been sent by the Minister of Propaganda and Enlightenment, Joseph Goebbels, to exploit the event to show the people Hitler was still taking an active role in the defence of Germany. Inside the Schloss, even after changing hands so many times throughout its history, it still retained the Baroque frescoes, wall hangings and furniture, in though many of the bullies of Rome had passed through its doors along with the women who had stayed there when it was the evangelical Frauen's Hilfsheim. In the main reception room, dominated by a row of tables pushed together and covered with a white sheet to form one great table, the adjutants of the C1 Corps were lined up along the wall. Hitler walked before them, holding out his hand to shake those of the officers, who, after releasing their grip, they gave the Hitler salute, which he returned with a casual flick from the elbow. But no longer did his hand stretch out straight, rather it resembled a claw, whilst his left hand hung limply at his side, twitching widely. Either as a result of the damage it received after Stauffenberg's failed assassination attempt, disease, or withdrawals from the medicine that Dr. Morell would normally be pushing into his veins, which he could not do from afar. Taking the singular chair that had been placed on the long edge of the makeshift map table, Hitler sat as Berlin, Reuss, Ritter von Greim, Odebrecht and Busse gathered around him. Berlin placed the operational maps of the Odebruch before the Führer, who perused briefly over the markings that had been drawn in the colour pencils of the operational staff. Taking in the situation, he drew his conclusions and began to lecture the silent party, that surrounded him as the Deutsche Wachenschau cameras rolled. Hitler looked to Busser, 
then turned to look away from reality as his gaze got lost in a distance. His right hand hammered up and down as he made a point, his eyes glazed and blinking every time that his hand rose and fell as he scolded those around him for the failures. And yet, despite the failing health of the man sat in front of them, no one could bring themselves to question his leadership or the decisions that he had made in placing Himmler as head of the army group. As Hitler continued to berate those inside, outside more troops gathered around the stone doorway of the Schloss, hoping to catch a glimpse of the Führer. If they were expecting one of Hitler's long rambling diatribes, they could count themselves lucky, as within 30 minutes of arriving, Hitler had seen all that he needed to see. As an adjutant helped to put his great coat on once more, the cameras began to roll again. Hands by the door raised as Hitler, holding his body as high as he could muster, walked out quickly, flicking his arm up and down, recognizing again the outstretched arms of the Hitler salute. Speedily he returned to the automobile where Erich Kempke had already started the motor and slid into the uncomfortable seat. As soon as the SS guard had closed the door, Kempke pressed the accelerator and the motorcade left the Schloss. The entire visit had just lasted 30 minutes. Hitler knew the Oder, the ancient former marshland of the Oderbruch, and the natural defensive positions of the Salo Heights were all now that stood in the way of the Red Army. From Schloss Harnikop, the motorcade drives to Hasselberg, onto Ludersdorf, Kunersdorf, Metzdorf, Gottesgabe, and Neuhardenburg. At Neuhardenburg, the divisional command of the 303rd Division, Duberit, and the General Lieutenant Hübner, who was a fanatical and reliable Nazi, was located. Gathering around the memorial to the fallen soldiers of the Great War, the officers of General Hübner's 303rd Division congregated with Hitler. Hitler spoke vigorously of victory. He shook the hands of all those gathered and talked of the spring offensive to push the Red Army back and to secure Germany's borders once again. It is then onwards towards Zelo and the heights that the motorcade now drives. The Zelo Heights is a natural ridge that overlooks the Oderbruch and the Oder River, and preparations were being made to fortify it, for it would be the last defense barrier between the Soviets and Berlin if they were to breach the Oder. To Platko, they first drove, then Guzzo, before arriving in Zelo for a short visit. Women and children gathered around the cars, they paused, and Hitler took the time to speak with them. Erich Kempke always impressed with how quickly people were reassured by the presence of Hitler. The villages of Friedersdorf and Dolgelin were then passed through before the next stop at divisional command of the 309, the Gross Berlin Division, under the command of Oberst Voitzberger. The 309, like the 303, had been divisions that had been involved in the defense of Kostrin but had managed to pull back before they were wiped out. Now they were both fortifying positions around Zelo and awaiting the next advancement of the Red Army. Hitler perused the Oderbruch briefly before once again returning to the motorcade. Once again through Friedersdorf they drove, then Zelo, before turning west to return to Berlin using Reichstrasse 1. As Erich Kempke drove, the Führer slumped in his seat his face looking to the flat floor of the Mercedes in which they travelled. Not a word did the Führer speak, and to Erich, he seemed lost in thought about the gravity of the situation that was casting a shadow over his features. Two hours later, after once again travelling through the ruins of Berlin, racing against the onset of the twilight of evening, when the British mosquito planes would once again swarm in the skies over the Hauptstadt of the ever-shrinking Reich, the five-car motorcade wound its way through the rubble piles of collapsed buildings and to the garages beneath the gardens of the Reichskanzlei, a building of splendor for a Reich of ruins. The Führer has paid a visit to one corps on the eastern front, primarily to the Duberitz and Berlin divisions. The effect of the Führer's visit both on officers and men was enormous. I think it's right that the Führer should now pay more frequent visits to the front to put an end to the nauseating rumour-mongering that he does not pay sufficient attention to the front. He does so, but in a way unimaginable to the simpler military minds. Nevertheless, 
on psychological grounds, it is essential for the Fuhrer to show himself in person, as he is doing. So the ceremonial commander of the Volkssturm and minister of propaganda and enlightenment, Joseph Goebbels, wrote that evening. Eric Kempker had watched as Hitler stepped from the car and returned to the bunker. He then returned the automobiles to their stations and prepared them for if the Fuhrer ever needed them again. He would not. Goebbels wished for Hitler to show himself more despite the risks. But never again would the man who at one point had commanded from Normandy to Moscow leave the grounds of the Reichskanzlei. Nevertheless, in the following days, Goebbels had the footage of Hitler's visit to Schloss Harnikop carefully edited into the Die Deutschen Wochenschau to be presented to audiences. Almost exactly two months after Hitler's last day out, the red flag on the 2nd of May 1945 would be raised over the Reichstag and Berlin would be conquered and a new chapter in the city's history would begin. The 9th German army did hold out at the Zelo Heights, but with lack of equipment, air support and weapons, eventually the numerically superior and well fueled Red Army would overrun the positions. Eric Kempke survived the war and would note down his experiences eventually to form them into books. Theodore Busser would work for the Federal Ministry of the Interior after the war and take part in the first NATO exercise, Phalix 66, before dying in 1986, followed a year later by Wilhelm Berlin. Franz Reuss, Heinrich Feuchtsberger and Job Odebrecht would also all survive the war. Rudolf Hübner was transferred to the Western Front very shortly after Hitler's visit, where he would hold court as judge, prosecutor and jury over the soldiers who failed to destroy the Ludendorff Bridge over the Rhine. He found them all guilty, and they were shot and buried where they fell. Shortly after, he was put in charge of Munich as commander and was responsible for the deaths of around 200 people by shooting or hanging. He was sentenced to four years in prison in 1948 for his role in the deaths as a result of the Ludendorff Bridge trial and would die himself in 1965. For Schloss Harnikop, the palace that stood since the late 18th century in design and change despite its numerous uses, the Wehrmacht, in a senseless act of destruction, lay waste to it as the Red Army encirclement of Berlin was completed in April 1945 and the final onslaught against the capital, now only of itself, began. However, as a twist, Gottlieb von Hesler, the Generalfeldmarschall, to last inhabit the building solely through his life until his death in 1919, cared for the community of Harnikop. Amongst other things, he donated the bell to the local church, a church in which he lays. I suspect he would be happy to know that from the ruins of the Schloss, a village was rebuilt as the villagers used the rubble of the palace to restore their homes. The last pieces of the Schloss were removed in 1970, and now nothing remains of the palace to which Hitler visited on his final day out. Achtung, Achtung. Here is the Sendersteller Berlin in Voxhaus. Thank you for listening to Hitler's Last Day Out, an Achtung History podcast produced by the Berlin Tour Guide, written and presented by myself, Simon J. James. If you wish for more from Achtung History, follow the podcast on Twitter and Instagram at Achtung History, or visit the website at theberlintourguide.com. You can also support the channel from as little as one euro a month on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash Arctum History.